Hello everyone. I'm going to be talking today about delivery and debugging of MariaDB Docker images. I hope you've come to the right place. If not, you can run away. That's okay. <laughs> so what I'm going to be talking about today is the kind of um, container bugs that we didn't expect um, as we're uh, doing container maintenance, a bit about the container runtime restrictions that apply. Um, about when you're actually using containers, there's a few opportunities that sort of can be taken advantage of. Um, and as we're looking at containers and the bugs we provide and the features that we get, we see that there's opportunities to improve the MariaDB code base. So I'm hoping, and throughout all of this, um, there's a, a element of uh, continuous integration and continuous delivery um, that aids through the process. And throughout the general theme um, of this talk, I'm going to be a bit guest talking about the ecosystem cooperation uh, that can result and is kind of needed as things evolve uh, a lot quickly and generally the ecosystems out there are, are ready to help you um, if you only ask. If we look at like what we see in a, a classical VM, is classical the right term, um, VM or BEM metal environment, we see that like we've got an application that you develop, we've got a set of libraries, we've got a kernel and, and got storage, all in this um, sort of one bundle sort of coming out uh, together. It's all like tested together um, and you know tested by other people so there's a lot of uh, inbuilt assumptions um, about the integration between all the components that is there. When we think about, you know, what is a, a container, we can say, well, okay, the, the kernel is given to us, the storage is given to us, so we only need to, you know, worry about the libraries in our application, right? Um, that's, that's a nice theory anyway. What ends up being the case is that effectively our users or the environments that we've been given tend to throw a rather um, arbitrary and mixed selection of kernels and uh, storage at us and as a MariaDB database we're just expected to magically work with all of them now and some of that you know comes through luck some of it comes through a bit of engineering but I guess what I'm going to go through is like where it's gone wrong So one instance, here's a um, output from a, a bug report that we get occasionally on, on a Kubernetes. They say they've got an NFS storage coming up. Um, if we see the logs, we see there's like a 30 seconds uh, output here. And so it's taking 30 seconds to write a 12 megabyte file and that's all that's happening, which doesn't particularly go well for a database server. You know, you expect a little, little higher throughput. Um, I honestly still don't know the story behind this because when we get these kind of bugs, it's like, how do I replicate the entire user's uh, environment to, to work out what actually went on here? And um, I welcome any suggestions um, now or later as to how to resolve these kind of bugs or e even understand them. Um, there's a workaround, you can put this temporary file elsewhere, but it's a little extra configuration to do so. A, another file system uh, thing that got thrown up at uh, CIFS uh, in MariaDB, um, apologies for the system calls, we do a function control to set the storage on a file descriptor to, to run odirect. It succeeds, it goes, yes I can do that, and then you write to it and it fails, it goes invalid. Um, and these are the kind of things uh, that pop up because, you know, it's easy in Kubernetes or environments to throw any kind of storage at you. And while databases may have historically run on, you know, this wonderful ancient technology called local storage, um, that that is um, becoming less common now. As a consequence, we need to you know, handle this kind of things. Um, there's a workaround in CIFS, if you mount it, um, no cache as like the mount option, it'll allow a 
O-Direct going through, but it takes a bit of investigation to get through these kind of issues. Uh, there's this other thing in the uh, ecosystem called Windows Subsystem for Linux, which I think means Windows looking like, but not really like Linux. <laughs> and what we see is that is like a Microsoft product that uh, emulates um, what Linux system calls into what native calls are underneath. Um, and let's say uh, it's not always a one-to-one -one mapping. So this particular Windows for subsystem bug um, came across it a while. If you open a file descriptor, rename the file and do an fstat on that file descriptor, um, it reports e no ent. It's like, how can it not exist anymore? I've got a file descriptor open. Now this may look like a particularly odd case. However, this is what is executed in the database engine whenever you do like an alter table and it needs to rewrite the table structure. So it's not a totally abnormal case to actually do this. Um, however, it's one that Windows as yet hasn't solved. I, I provided a bit more information at the beginning of the week. So I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that we'll one day do it. And this is, I guess, one of the examples that, you know, cooperation with the community, um, whoever it is, is needed to try to resolve these issues. Um, either that or you've got to reinvent your code base. Crazy and things. Um, this is uh, another error that I got. At. Um, this was when I changed the code, um, sorry, the base image of MariaDB to um, a, a Docker Jammy, uh, sorry, an Ubuntu Jammy image um, that I tested locally, works fine. Um, you know, immediately after a release into a stable version, you know, users go, what, there's this error, I don't know what it is. And yeah, they're involved a bit of discussion because it's like me, I can't reproduce this. I've no idea what you're talking about. Um, and, you know, eventually there's some discussion about uh, when it does occur, when it doesn't occur, OS X is fine, this is fine. Uh, someone worked it out before and said, ah, Linux uh, frequently asked questions um, means that there's an answer there. So what the problem ended up being is um, seccomp filters. Uh, so seccomp filters are a restriction on the APIs that a kernel can, sorry, that a container can actually perform on the kernel. Uh, there was this clone three system course, um, the things you don't see when you're doing application program, but that was uh, initially blocked because it's an allow list. Uh, so what happened in a Docker version before 20.10.10, um, you know, it, it didn't recognize this call and allow it. Um, this was actually in the Ubuntu vocal and, and Jammy at, at the time. Um, at, by the time Jammy was released, there was an update. Um, however, some people, as you know, don't always update to latest container versions. It's amazing, amazing that they jump ahead at a MariaDB version, but not a Docker container, a Docker runtime version. But as a consequence, um, this is kind of the errors that you get. Um, as I was looking through this uh, particular issue that came up in preparation for this talk, I looked back at like some of the projects that had come across this and found some people are still running seccomp unconfined on MariaDB or pinning MariaDB to a version before I um, dump the base. And I just want to say, please don't do that. Um, you know, if you get a disable a security feature, might hurt to you know um, look again every once in a while to see if it's actually fixed and relevant especially on such a transitory issue um, also MariaDB 10.7 was a short-term release so uh, it's not even supported anymore um, and this probably isn't as relevant to your users or the ci environments so I'll interlude with some bad news that like failure is kind of in, uh, certain. Um, it's an evolving market that, you know, things will go wrong at very important. But it's also very important to realise you, you can trust your community. that they're, they're not out to get you or lynch you on every mistake that goes wrong. Um, they're there to help. 
and if you're responsive, if you're communicative, um, they'll be able to help you. Uh, also, CI tests um, will help because ultimately it's the, the user's responsibility to see if a container works in their environment. Um, there's only so much as like a, a distributor or producer of an image that um, you can be responsible for. So if you're a user, run CI tests. If something goes wrong, um, it may be us, but you know, um, let us know. The other thing I want to actually cover um, as a brief interlude is the kind of bugs you get is um, you may assume as a MariaDB distributor that I get bugs about MariaDB, but once you throw it in a container image, all of a sudden you get blamed for everything that's in the container as well. Maybe that's fair, maybe it's not. Um, so a uh, first instance up there is like libfka, which is something I don't even remember. Um, was underneath GPG as a dependency. It wasn't used by MariaDB directly. Uh, it was used when the package was built to verify their signature, but um, that doesn't stop users from saying there's a vulnerability in your image, hurry up and fix it. Um, and the same with OpenSSL uh, was there. What's good about being part of, say, the Docker Official Images program is that Ubuntu in the Docker in Official Images gets a uh, regular update about every month. Um, sometimes they push one a little bit early and once they rebuild their Docker image there, they automatically rebuild every dependent container there. So um, when these came out, I was pretty confident that, you know, it was already in the pipeline of being fixed anyway. So um, despite the low vulnerabilities. The GoSU um, vulnerability and we've come across this a couple of times that people um, will say uh, it's got a vulnerability. I'll go back a step. GoSU is basically a cut down version of Sudo. Uh, it changes user and executes something. It's just one of the artifacts of, of running as a, a, a root container and needing to drop down privileges. Uh, what's happening with like vulnerability scanners is they go, oh, this is a Go application. That must mean it's sort of vulnerable to um, every CVE and uh, security vulnerability in the <laughs> that could possibly exist in Go. And so we've got a status page in this from a few days ago that lists like we've got two critical bugs, um, 28 high bugs. Um, and 12 medium bugs. And as you can see, the, the top contributor up there is a, a standard lib, which is uh, from Go. So if that wasn't there, <laughs> it'd actually look quite good. And of all those vulnerabilities that are there, they're all much, pretty much a false alarm. Um, so, you know, we've got actually work with our uh, Docker Scout that sort of produced this and say, okay, can we get to a stage where we're actually reporting real vulnerabilities only and not other ones? Uh, it is possible. Um, Go, uh, for any of those who program it in, have, there's a Go vol checker in there that will um, test the scope of the standard library usage within an application and see if it's vulnerable, but even not. So once that's out of the way, there's only um, a three low and a couple of medium. And incidentally, one of those mediums, Ubuntu's got one of their packages marked as vulnerable when it's actually not in the release notes. So there's a bit of communication that needs to happen to, uh, in the security landscape to ensure the right information is getting to the users. Um, get users that sort of say, um, our company policy is if there's a vulnerability checked in our project, program, we automatically eject that image from the life cycle is okay. Um, it may happen, but you know, that's kind of your problem. Um, but you know, what we can do is to try to actually get some decent information up there. And I'm not the only one that's sort of come across this. Um, this is, I guess, a uh, Sona cube also, uh, came across this kind of issue that they're, they're doing vulnerability assessments on, uh, things that it picked up in the scanning, uh, they're not always true. And, you know, at the 
time I think various people in the security and the container um, distributor landscape are pushing out information and, and trying to work out uh, how to actually resolve this in a meaningful way. I mean, um, yeah, the, there's things that can show up in packages that are vulnerable in a particular set of circumstances, but if they're not exploitable, well, they're not exploitable and we need a way to communicate that without um, responding in every issue or I think as Kate was um, uh, uh, say, saying in a, a previous talk that, you know, doing blog posts and that kind of thing isn't that scalable. Um, another thing, uh, SecComp um, applies some restrictions. Currently Euring's um, blocked again. Um, it wasn't blocked at one stage and it all very much depends on the runtime. Uh, and, you know, I've looked in the bank, uh, uh, history as to why it happens and sure, um, Google's paid out a mil million dollars in security uh, vulnerability uh, payouts for exploits into um, IOU ring. That equates to, I think, about 15 vulnerabilities this year. I can see why they've restricted it off. Um, it may get unrestricted again. But from a point of um, developing software, you've got to realize that just because your kernel supports it, um, you know, doesn't mean it's going to be available. Uh, other restrictions that come into play, um, uh, the uh, dev, I always get the order mixed up. Sysdev block um, provides a bunch of information about uh, the host environment. Now, quite rightly, you can assume that, well, maybe a container shouldn't know much about the host environment. Um, however, if you're actually providing storage to it, you need to know a little bit about it because to write uh, to a odirect file, you need to know the physical block size, otherwise you get errors. So in discussion with like Podman and, and trying to actually improve this information was like, maybe there's a way that we can provide some information, uh, particularly if that storage is exposed into the container. So um, I need to finish this off. Oops, too much time at conferences. Uh, who's heard of Aptainer? No one? Oh, okay. Um, a singularity um, as a runtime, it's, it's a HPC project. Um, that renamed to Aptainer under the Linux Foundation. Uh, it's also got the ability of running uh, OCI containers, which at MariaDB obviously is. However, it applies a, a much more strict approach that the container insides aren't actually writable. Um, and what that means is some things that may have worked in like a Docker environment or a Podman environment don't immediately work um, in an Aptainer. And this uh, for MariaG included a Unix socket that we provide for connection locally, which is that still relevant inside a container. It's kind of used in its startup. Um, there's also a PID file there. Um, when was the last time we needed them? Um, I can't remember, it was a while ago. Maybe we should remove that out of our code base. So at least that's one other thing that doesn't need to be there anymore. Another thing you uh, containers and, and the run times assume is like a start time and stop time. And for Docker, this is like 10 seconds because why would a container take longer than 10 seconds to start or stop? Uh, when this limit is exceeded, what happens is the container runtime just kills off the, the process. Uh, and we get bug reports that says, you know, why is every time I start MariaDB, it's crashed recovery? It's like, yeah, this is this is why. Uh, so I mean, MariaDB is a, a it's an ACID database. So sure, it can tolerate being killed at any particular time, um, but you know it doesn't mean it's the best approach to do all the time. Um, so by increasing the timeout to say one and a half minutes, as the user did. Uh, that sort of was sure one and a half minutes in their shutdown that was longer. However, it saved them like two minutes in crash recovery. So um, you can tell where our optimized paths are. <laughs> uh, 
What Red Hat has been doing uh, is a bunch of integration between uh, container runtimes and systemd and they've provided ways to run containers under systemd and what's sort of interesting about this is that there's a notify setting in, in the systemd service uh, that means the container can start to communicate these ready kind of signals that are relevant in say the systemd context to a healthy setting in a container context in both of these runtime environments have a lot of similarities, so it's, um, it makes only sense that the functionality that's there under systemd and sort of has been for the last, uh, when did systemd come around? 2015, someone correct me if I'm wrong, about that time. Um, it sort of became a bit more mainstream, so we've got a function functionality that is in systemd that could actually apply to containers and simplify our process that way. Uh, on the MariaDB side, uh, we've come across some behaviours that have been there for ages, i.e. ignoring, ignoring global writable uh, configuration files. It made sense at one stage, it was sort of possible to write uh, if you had access to a system with a MariaDB config that was globally writable, you could just write user equals root, um, some variant of select into out file etc password, and you'd get a privilege escalation. Um, hasn't been for a while since MariaDB is run under a system D service, but um, it's, uh, the code was still there. It's a problem for containers because when you run them under a Windows file system and have that kind of mounted into a container, sure the Linux subsystem for Linux will handle the rest mostly, um, but there's an aspect of, well, okay, you can't map a Windows file system permission across, so it just goes, it looks like global writable. Um, and that's a problem, I guess, if you start a container up with a specific config, and that gets ignored because it's globally writable. Yeah, f funny intricacies in of, of things. So I guess what's possible in volumes is for the volume to be actually marked as read only. Um, and once that happens, all we need to do is change the server code to say, well, if the file system's read only, I guess it's not exploitable. And that's what I did. And that's been there in the last release. Doesn't mean that's the end of it. There's possibly still avenues of going a, a little bit further and saying, well, okay, if it's globally writable file, maybe can uh, enable some like unsafe mode, which restricts um, setting of things like user and, and that kind of thing. So uh, just to make it a, a little more user friendly um, that, you know, if a user forgets a, a read only on the config file, they're not banging their head. Uh, for ages to work out uh, why it's not being applied. Um, this was a few years ago, but um, the time zone initialization was slow, was, was the bug report. Um, MariaDB to initialize all its time zone data reads a bunch of uh, user, user share zone info, um, generates a bunch of SQL statements of insert, uh, and dumps them into tables to do that. Uh, originally with MariaDB 10.3, which is incidentally now end of life, uh, uh, that was reasonably fast under my ISO. Uh, when Monty reinvented it as ARIA and added a bunch of crash safety, that mean that slowed down like the insert operations to make them crash safe. Uh, and as such, it was fine on, you know, Monty's machine that sort of did it. It was fine on the CI environments. Uh, but users out there, you know, kind of sometimes use a little bit slower storage than um, what developers and CI machines do. So this disparity between what a, a user has, its storage and what's tested, um, what fell out and, you know, the users said, well, it just doesn't start or it was taking minutes or, tens of minutes to start. Turned out it was um, uh, reasonably easy to fix. You do a lock tables under it and once that was applied to the code base, 
um, it was all fixed that way. In the way I've talked about the last few examples that there is um, the things you come across in the container world that uh, end up being applied back to the MariaDB code based that kind of improvements. Uh, there's another feature out there currently um, that sort of increase improved database migrations. So if you've got a database, you want it to migrate the data to the new structure and then be available to the application. So you've got this uh, seemingly contradictory requirements. I want the uh, container not to be accessible to the application, but I want it to be accessible to um, the migration scripts that do all the alter tables and that kind of thing. And those kind of requirements need to make us look back and reflect and uh, rework the way the, the code and add new features into the way it did. So the way we're thinking of doing this is to start it on a different port, provide some container uh, volume um, of the migration scripts that they want to run. And when those migration scripts are finished, it'll go back and start listing on a um, uh, public port where your application submits. And it's that kind of um, requirement that means, you know, it, uh, MariaDB can come more container friendly uh, for the user base. Uh, but there's also flow on effects that, you know, that functionality can be used uh, elsewhere in say the Debian uh, packaging to auto run its upgrades and its check scripts um, uh, while the user isn't trying to run an application on it. Okay, that's, that's enough of bugs. I want to actually talk about some opportunities. So MariaDB has a build bot um, of our CI infrastructure that's sort of public. Um, the container image of the MariaDB uh, Docker official image is public. Um, so since we're actually doing most of the work in public anyway, what I uh, decided to do um, a year, year and a half, uh, lost track, but um, there's a uh, container images actually pushed up into CI that are consumable by anyone. Uh, so this is uh, our running of um, the CI on, uh, on, the, on the container. So every commit into the server uh, produces an image and that is actually tested against the test cases of the container image as part of our um, CI process. And out of that pops a, um, this is URL from Quay.io and it uh, gets um, images. So what I've done, I've sort of tagged them on the, the branch name. So I've just gone the very sick 10.4, uh, 10.3 10 and 10.6 when the developers don't trip over things. I uh, finished their branches. Sorry. Can you get that? Um, <laughs> it's what ha happens when I walk around. Now it may take that a while to get uh, uh, up, so I'll just, you know, wing it uh, at end and actually be able to see you all anyway. So uh, before that blanked out, um, what might have been the case is there was um, uh, 10.4 is the earliest long-term support release. So we actually tag that with those particular tags. 10.3 was the, the latest version and that um, had its own tag. So we've done that so it's easy for uh, people running CI systems against MariaDB to say, okay, set up once. We want to test from your earliest version to your latest version and maybe a long-term support uh, version. Obviously be more careful now. Um, and, and those are alias to the same thing as we see here, like the earliest, the earliest long to support is this 10.4 release and the very latest is 10.3. And that corresponds to a, uh, a release candidate. It's not the alpha code. I think I'll stop moving my feet now. It seems dangerous. <laughs> so if you were to consume um, MariaDB and MySQL images in your CI, uh, what you'd actually do is um, you could ex uh, take the container names and then you've just got a uh, MariaDB foundation dash MariaDB develops slash earliest slash latest 
uh, and now you're actually testing against what is going to be effectively in the next release of MariaDB. Uh, this will save projects um, that uh, may have like a, a regression. It's like MariaDB does a release, uh, we tweak something or, um, that we shouldn't have, uh, and now all of a sudden, you know, Project X needs to uh, interact with that. If, if projects are actually consuming this um, ahead of time, uh, we'll see things that are starting to pop up as problems before our release and save other projects a release of their own. The other way to use uh, containers is that when users produce bugs, uh, sorry, when MariaD produces bugs and uh, users actually notice them, uh, that developers sometimes go through a process like, um, have I really fixed it for the user? Now, because we've got uh, a CI process that produces packages and containers, a developer can push to a, a branch name that has a package test in it, and automatically at the end of that, that a user will have a container that they can uh, test with to see if it's actually fixed their problem. And that's particularly um, relevant for some of the, the harder to prove or communicate uh, problems that exist. So CI is a magical thing that um, enables uh, people to test them and have something that's consumable by the user. So in conclusion, if you're doing your own development, the, the things to uh, take note of in um, preparation or in consideration of doing container work is that you should rely on, say, runtime checks of particular storage functionality, uh, and if they're not available, fall back to simple uh, mechanisms. So if IO Euring isn't available, we'll fall back to an, an, a synchronous file IO mechanism. And that's what we were doing in MariaDB anyway, but it's, it's a good thing to practice as far as development is to have redundant code bars depending on the functionality available. Take opportunities as you get um, bug reports um, and user feedback to re-examine the things you're doing in your own code base because there's, there's better ways of uh, doing some things. The things that may have been relevant um, 10 to 20 to 30 years ago um, maybe aren't relevant now and there's possibly ways of doing it better and still being compatible. By engaging your user base, um, you can actually test the, the concept changes to not only the containers. Um, I didn't quite mention that the Quayo images, they included latest changes in the container as well as the kernel. So we're providing those so users can test them, um, you know, before they become a, an official image and welcoming uh, bug reports ahead of time. Uh, as I was saying, you know, take part in the communities around you. The container runtimes actually care about what you have as a requirement. Um, so, you know, communicate those. If you need, um, you know, storage information to be accessible, tell them why and they'll actually, uh, in many cases, bend over to, to help you out or at least give you the opportunity to write your own pull request and, um, and, and change uh, their code with review. There's an overlap between, I guess, system D and containers as both service managers and the features they offer. Um, say, for instance, that uh, start, stop time uh, in system D since version about 234 or something, there's a extend timeout so containers can actually, oh, sorry, so a system D service can tell its container manager, yes, I'm, I'm still working, I'm getting closer uh, to a solution. Now, once that sort of integration becomes possible with containers, containers can start to say, well, um, you know, I'm, I'm still working, I'm, I'm still trying to shut down cleanly, uh, give us a little bit more time. Um, and that means that that sort of thing can be done cooperatively um, without 
uh, introducing other operators or, or functionality to say, you know, watch this because ultimately it's a functionality within MariaDB itself. The last bit on communities is taking part in discussions with security vulnerability assessment um, and uh, how they do the things, the processes that you want. Um, yes, we want to be able to uh, say this may be a vulnerable packy thing in, in our image, but it can be mitigated in this way, or this thing isn't vulnerable at all, or um, those kind of things. So I, I'm probably dreaming a little bit um, uh, for that to be happened, but those are the kind of discussions that sort of need to be, take place for users to get the right experience and an accurate experience of what really happening. Uh, utilize your CI systems to help your users validate your bug fixes, um, provide pre-release testing um, so they can uh, test it in their own environments because after all the only um, workload that really matters to a user is theirs um, so they've got all the ability to test it and if you can alleviate that burden of um, compile, build, repackage, and just you know streamline that delivery to them. Um, that means they can give you good feedback um, ahead of your release. Uh, on you know the good kind of bugs, um, occasionally get one like this. You, the performance is too fast in Docker. Um, I'm really sorry. <laughs> so that's a good note I want to end on that some some bug reports just bring a, a joyful you know <laughs> smile to your face every once in a while so that's all I have now um, I'm Daniel at MariaDB and that's the end of my talk uh, if there's any questions